Welcome to Worldview Matters, discussing controversial issues, discerning current events, defending biblical Christianity. No topic off limits. And now, here's your host, David Fiorazzo. Hey guys, welcome to the show. We're going across the pond for this one today to Australia. I've got a brother, Dean Dwyer, and uh, he's served for over 20 years as pastor and president of Iser Street Baptist Church in Toowoomba, Australia. And you can go to the website if you want to check out Dean, IserBaptistChurch.com. Iser is spelled E-I-S-E-R Street. Pastor Dean has been a co-founder of Sound the Alarms Ministries. We're going to talk a little bit about that, and that seeks to highlight how current events play into Bible prophecy. The ministry was formed in response to the craziness of COVID and uh, everything that was perpetrated on Australian shores. We have saw that worldwide pretty much as well, but um, now they've pivoted a little bit from being COVID-focused to an overall ministry focused on speaking the truth to a deceived culture. Dean Dwyer, welcome to Worldview Matters. Good to see you, brother. G'day from the land down under. How are you, David? I'm doing great. And I know there's a time difference. Thank you for waking up early uh, with us. I, I told you before we started, you can't tell. So you must add a good night's sleep. Um, so uh, Thank you, brother. Yes, yeah. it's very early here. But I said to my wife, if I was going to get up early for anything, it would be to talk about God, Bible prophecy, and to talk to David Fiorazzo. Oh, my goodness. I'm, 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 that's a pretty big list there that I'm part of. So <laughs> Blessings, brother. Um, so, yeah, let's tell a little bit about how we connected. I have been reading your articles for quite some time over at HarbingersDaily.com, and you've got a page over there at Harbingers Daily, and you put out some great articles. We're going to get to some of those in another show with you because we're going to have Dean back next week, and we're going to talk to him again on a couple of his recent articles. But, Dean, uh, share a little bit uh, how we connected and uh, just uh, give our audience a, a little idea of, of how we actually connected here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I've said to you, David, you've been uh, great for my ministry. You've been edifying, and I've appreciated that very much. Mm. A couple of years ago, when we all went through this crazy COVID period, there was a period there where the Aussie church was really languishing, and we were copying a fair bit of heat from the public. So a lot of the public in Australia... We're looking to the church, looking for leadership because the Australian people were being tyrannized. Uh, they were uh, just under the heavy hand of government during that time. So I was criticized on social media. And so I thought, okay, now's the time to really reach out to like-minded people. And I remember one day I was out going for a walk and I started to, to look further afield uh, overseas in terms of trying to find you know, other people, like-minded people who could minister to me, that could help me to surround me with other people who would be bold enough to stand up and tell the truth of what's happening. And so, David, I came across your name. Uh, Providentially, some would say by accident, but I say providentially. And, you know, that was a wonderful thing. Came across Mm. your name and I started listening to you and Mm. I thought, wow, this guy is fantastic. He's speaking truth. He's speaking biblical truth. He's not afraid to tackle issues head on. And I started listening to you, started reading about you. And my connection with Harbingers Daily is actually as a result of you as well, because you spoke about Harbingers. Awesome. And so I thought, well, this is a great ministry. So I started to read a lot of the material on Harbingers Daily as well. And you'd mentioned that you had just been made a trusted ministry at Harbingers Daily. And I thought, wow. Is that open for everybody? So I'd reached out to them and praise God, this is where the connection forms. So, David, I must thank you in person for being Mm. such an integral part of that connection with Harbingers Daily because they've been a great blessing for our church because we've met so many people in Australia that read Mm. Harbingers Daily that we've been able to connect with in our local area. Oh, my goodness. I'm so thankful for them. Steve, yeah. shout out to Steve and Brianna and the gang over there and, uh, at Harbingers. Uh, they operate yeah. out of uh, Canada. And so mm. we kind of kind of got three countries connecting here uh, yeah. in the spirit, uh, so to speak. Oh, Dean. That's right. <laughs> um, I just want to share briefly. Um, I was going through a time right around 2020 uh, when the covid craziness was going on. And I, I don't remember, how did I find out about Liberty Pastors, libertypastors.com? 
uh, Paul Blair, Dan Fisher, Steve Smotherman, Trevor Loudon, um, Alex Newman, and so many other uh, pastors and other speakers that were bold, talking about globalism, talking about Bible mm. prophecy, talking about yep. culture, talking about politics, uh-oh, moral <laughs> issues that uh, we've been told were political, but they're moral issues, friends. Like, yep. anyway, I don't want to go down that road. But I was feeling kind of like a Lone Ranger there. I think at the time mm. I was an associate pastor at a church, and there weren't that many people in our area here that I could relate to. Like you mm. said, you were sharing earlier, yep. you were going, wow, we, I wish I could find some people. Iron sharpens iron, right? Absolutely. People that we are like-minded, uh, kindred spirits. And when mm -hmm. I went to that conference, it just was a, it was a catalyst in my life. And I wrote about it in one of the chapters in my book, my, book, mm. my previous book, Canceling Christianity. But Dean, I want to get to your story. Um, we also wanted to ask you a little bit about sound the alarms. So you said you started during the COVID craziness and now it's taken a little uh, transformation. So tell us about sound the alarms dot com. Yeah, so sound the alarms formed during COVID. Uh, a lot of your viewers would probably be familiar with how heavy handed our government was. Mm -hmm. So the government really pushed the shot. They made it as mandatory as possible. And so the uptake rate because they locked people out of cafes, they locked them out of theatres, restaurants. They made life so difficult for people and tried to force them into taking the experimental gene therapy. And so because the public was crying out for leadership in this area, we decided that we would get together, a group of us from our local church, and start Sound the Alarms. And the, the name Sound the Alarms actually comes from the book of Joel. And if you're familiar with Joel chapter 2, verse 1, it refers to blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm. Hmm. And so that's where the name was born because it goes on to talk about warning that the day of the Lord is at hand. So the ministry, hmm. although in the early stages was really focused on COVID and trying to combat a lot of the misinformation that was coming from the government, it is now pivoted because we see so many different areas where we need to sound the alarm, particularly as we see the approaching tribulation period, because we really are living in perilous times. And unfortunately, most people are really asleep to the fact that God's mm. wrath is going to fall upon this earth. But there yep. is a savior. His name is yep. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And judgment is coming, friends. Is. I mean, in some form or fashion, some people believe God's judging in different ways. Um, yeah. Our country, you know, here in the States, we've fallen away big time. There is a mm -hmm. remnant of solid Bible-believing pastors and teachers and, and Christians. Um, but I'll tell you, we, we've got our work cut out for us because it is so dark nowadays because we've, we've been silent too long. So, Dean Dwyer, tell us a little bit about the Australian church. Um, give us a little feel for what being a Christian there, a Bible-believing Christian mm. is like in Australia and how you got to where you are. Yeah. So you're right in terms of what you say with God judging in this current age. And most people misunderstand God's judgment. God's judgment can involve just handing people over to their own debased mind. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the concept of Romans 1, we see in there in particular, we see God says he hands them over to a debased mind. And in the Greek, that is the word atokimos. And essentially it means it's a disqualified mind. So it is no longer a mind fit for purpose. God made it in order to think great and glorious thoughts about himself, to seek him and to learn ways of righteousness and holiness. But unfortunately, because mankind has sought after perversion, God has handed them over. And this is a disqualified mind. And unfortunately, these people are leading our governments. They're leading our school boards. They're leading... Uh, our libraries and so people with a disqualified mind are leading society and unfortunately church leaders are sitting back allowing this to happen so the australian church i describe it probably in four ways we have the dead the dying the divided and the dedicated and so they pretty like much that. speak for themselves <laughs> so the dead are obviously the spiritually dead you know they're the ones that are ritualistic in their worship uh, there's not too much life about them. We see a semblance of form about them, but there's no power. Hmm. There's no hope. There's no future. And so they just go about their worship in an empty way without offering any hope for the Australian people. 
Then you have the dying. And these are the ones that probably did have life about them, but are slowly dying because there's a lack of power in their Christian life. And in some ways, I like to refer to these people as spiritual mannequins, because you see, you know, mannequins in a store window, they look like they're human, but they can't speak. And so the Australian church in some respects is like that. And this applies globally as well. That's there are many spiritual mannequins. They look like a church, but they don't have life in them. And mm. most importantly, because a mannequin can't speak, the Australian church isn't speaking either. Unfortunately, it's not touching on a lot of the current events that we see throughout the world. It's not touching on things happening in Israel. Mm. It's not happen- It's not touching on things that are occurring in Bible prophecy, which speak of the fact that God's judgment is about to fall upon this earth. Mm. And you have the divided. Uh, unfortunately, Australia is a divided church yes. as well. Same as America. Go ahead, Dean. Absolutely. And, you know, I think... You've got division along theological lines. You know, that's natural because you've got so many denominations. Uh, But we see a sense and we get a sense of the globalist elites probably reaching into Australia as well, trying to divide, particularly as we see Marxism continue to infiltrate our politics as well. We have a political system which is very left-leaning at the moment. Uh, We have a political system quite different to America where you have predominantly a two-party system. We have a two-party system where there's two major parties and a number of minor parties. But aside from some conservative minor parties, unfortunately, Australia is very left-leaning. And so the church is also headed in that direction Mm. as well. So there's a lot of division in there. But then as you touched on, we have the dedicated, and this is the remnant part of the church. They're the people like yourself, like your viewers, like the people who sit in our pews. They're really awake to what's going on. They're eager to know about what's going on and they're looking. They're looking, learning, watching and paying attention to what's happening throughout the world. Mm. We've got to take a break now, but we are speaking with Pastor Dean Dwyer. And before we do, when you were explaining these churches, the dead, the dying, the divided and the dedicated, I thought about uh, Revelation 2 and 3 and Mm -hmm. how Jesus rebuked five of the seven churches in Asia Minor. And I want to just read from uh, Revelation 3, uh, verse... Two, uh, verse one and two, it says, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name or you have Mm -hmm. a reputation that you're Mm -hmm. alive, but you are dead. Jesus is speaking to a Christian Mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God, Remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Again, friends, he's speaking to Christians, believers, to the church. Repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I come to you. And then it goes on. But friends, uh, we'll be right back with Dean Dwyer on Worldview Matters. Today's show is brought to you by Harbinger's Daily. World news biblically understood. Stay informed at harbingersdaily.com. Pastor Dean Dwyer is with us, and his home is Australia. He is in Toowoomba, Australia. And you can get uh, all of his writings at harbingersdaily.com. If you go to the left-hand column there, you'll see a lot of the ministries, a lot of the people that write for Harbingers. And uh, he's uh, smack in the middle of some of the, some of the most, uh, to me, uh, impressive names in the Christian, evangelical Christian community that are speaking the truth. And uh, we're going to talk about Bible prophecy coming up. But Dean, I wanted to ask you, um, I'm sure you've written about this. I, I just really enjoyed those four things because I'm kind of simple. And when you start things off in a bullet point list, mm-hmm. I, it really makes sense. As far as the church, the dead, the dying, the divided and the dedicated. Have you written in depth about that? I'm sure you have. But uh, has it been a while or what? It comes from a sermon, actually. And I'm glad you touched on Revelation 3 because that's exactly where the inspiration came from. Hmm. Uh Jesus, as you said, was speaking to the church at Sardis. And I think that fundamentally the problem with many Christians today is that they don't look at the book of Revelation. Many see it as allegorical 
And so many don't know how to read it, understand it, apply it to their life. But the seven letters to the churches in Revelation are so important and they're very telling for where we're at. We know that we're at the Laodicean era church, unfortunately, and we see that throughout the world in the church. And we know that the description is, I wish you were either hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. And so we see that very much in the Australian church as well. Not all throughout the Australian church. We have some wonderful remnant pastors, preachers and Christians in Australia, but they are very few and far between, unfortunately. Um, you a little shout out to Laodicea there. And uh, sometimes I, I look at the American church, I'm going, wow, that's us. Mm. Um, lukewarm. Um, silent and another fascinating verse there again Jesus speaking to the churches to Christians and in yeah. Revelation 3 20 what is Jesus the Lord and Savior the head of the church Dean Dwyer what is Jesus yep. doing he's standing outside the door of the church knocking that is such a sobering thought and that was in the early church in those days there were still uh, perhaps eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, or at least eyewitnesses to some of the disciples and apostles. And it wasn't, it wasn't that long into the church history there. And there are still people that, that were lukewarm and they needed to repent. And so there's nothing new under the sun. Just like that today, there are people that are lukewarm in Australia, mm. in America, that need to repent. And I'm not talking about people outside the church. What are your thoughts before we move on, Dean? Because I've always found that to be fascinating. People try to use that as an evangelical verse to get people saved, but that's yep. to the church. It, yeah, it absolutely is. And I often say to people, and you touched on it earlier, when you talk about strengthening what remains, and that was that passage you read before the break. And I often say to people, if you really want to strengthen your faith, there's an obscure book that I send people to, and that's the book of Nehemiah. And people often say, well, why should I read Nehemiah? Why should I read about rebuilding walls in order to rebuild my faith? But as we know, Nehemiah is not just about walls. It's about rebuilding the people. Mm. It's about strengthening and rebuilding their faith. And I'll tell you four points that we can, we can learn from this, four key characteristics from that time. Number one, they had a mind to work. And you mm. and I, David, know just how much work it takes in ministry. A uh, lot of sacrifices, a lot of work. So you've got to have a mind to work. You've got to have a heart to pray. And that's an important one as well. I think prayer is really lost in modern Christianity, uh, particularly in, in some churches. You know, there's more time devoted to announcements, unfortunately, than prayer. So we really need to be, get back into our prayer lives. Number three, they had developed an eye to watch. And we've been touching on a series. I've been doing a series for over a year now called What Does the Watchman Watch? And what we sought to do in that series is just really highlight particular areas that we need to be focused on, that perhaps some people in the church have overlooked so that we can direct our focus in particular ways to make sure that we're across the full spectrum of Bible prophecy. And as you touched on, they also developed an ear to hear. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really important because as you said, in the letters to the seven churches in Revelation, what does it say? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And as you said, Jesus himself said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears me, are we hearing the Lord Jesus at the moment? That's the question mm. for the church. Wow. I like those. And, man, you brought up Nehemiah, so we, we can't move on. We've got to talk about <laughs> Nehemiah a little bit more because one of my favorite chapters in Nehemiah is, I admit, you know, we, at the beginning, you know, he prays and he goes to the king. The king grants him favor. Go rebuild or go check out Jerusalem. He goes and, and his massive undertaking of finding, getting the people and organizing that rebuilding of the city walls around the entire city. But in Nehemiah 4, when the people were intimidated, there were mockers. There were people trying to instill fear in the people to discourage them from doing the work of God. And how applicable is that to our lives? If, if the Satan has success in discouraging you or I from doing mm -hmm. God's work, he's won the battle. He doesn't have to fight. Yeah. He just mocks and tries to discourage us. But what did they do? 
gets to the point where the people are ready to fight. They're working with one hand and they're holding a yep. sword or a weapon with the other. That yeah. is one of the most fascinating parts of believe I believe in Nehemiah 4 at least where they're literally they're they're ready for the warfare what happened when they were working and ready to fight holding the sword mm. the enemies got discouraged the enemies yep. they said mm. all right we're not going to attack now because the Jews were on alert you mentioned watchmen on the wall sounding mm. the alarm they were ready so I just found that to be fascinating before we move on Dean just your thoughts on that yeah, absolutely. The other key characteristic of that time as well was that Nehemiah really uh, put forward the importance of fighting for someone close to you. So he would put family groupings together because what that encouraged was that if you're looking to your mother, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, who's right next to you, you're going to fight for them mm. if you see the enemy coming. And so unfortunately, too often we have these Lone Ranger Christians who think they need to be out there fighting the battle for themselves. Now, sometimes that's by product. You mentioned that in the opening, that sometimes you feel like you're alone. But this is the importance of fellowship, particularly in these end days, that we really need to gather around like-minded believers to, to look at the ones we love, to fight for them. Because, you know, Satan wants to divide. He wants to discourage. He wants to destroy. <clears throat> and so we really need to gather our family closely and remember who we're fighting for, and remember who we're worshipping, mm. and the fact that we have a victorious Christian life. But the fifth and, and probably the most important aspect in Nehemiah's day was that they had a godly man who stood up mm. and pointed the way. And yes. that is so important. It's so important in our churches. It's so important in our communities. We need, please, we need godly men. Stand up. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Stand up boldly, courageously. Mm. Fight for truth, fight for your family, fight for righteousness. Leaders need to lead. Oh, my mm. goodness. A good word, Dean. Um, so when we do another show with you, we're going to be talking about a couple of your articles over at Harbinger's Daily. And uh, friends, I just encourage you to go to check out his material. We've got five minutes left, but go to harbingersdaily.com. Get caught up with some of Dean's articles and also all what they're the latest from Israel and the Middle East and the war. But Dean, you mentioned in an email to me, I didn't remember this. Australia, you said, was instrumental in the rebirth of the modern state of Israel. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Australia is an interesting case in in that whole drama. And in Australia, we often shorten the name Australia to Oz. And interestingly, in Hebrew, the word Oz means strength or might. Now, hmm. Australia might not be strong and mighty nowadays because it's caved to some social justice movements, the Marxist ideologies. But you go back 100 years ago or more, and we're about to celebrate another anniversary of this key battle. And that was the 31st of October, 1917. And this was a great battle at Beersheba, which is in southern Israel. So this was, I believe, the last charge of a light horse brigade, which had overcome some entrenched Ottoman Turks there. And so on this particular day, there were 800 horsemen up against overwhelming odds. But by God's providence and grace, they had galloped forward. They had overrun the positions, uh, many machine gunners, many other infantry troops there. And that was instrumental then in turning the war. And we know that two days after that, 2 November 1917, uh, we have the beginnings of the Balfour Declaration. Mm -hmm. And I'll read a quote from Benjamin Netanyahu because on in 2017, when we had the 100-year anniversary of the battle, at Beersheba, Benjamin Netanyahu spoke at a commemorative ceremony there, and he said this, Nearly 4,000 years ago, Abraham came to Beersheba, the city of seven wells. Exactly 100 years ago, brave Anzac soldiers liberated Beersheba for the sons and daughters of Abraham and opened the gateway for the Jewish people to re-enter the stage of history. Hmm. So that's a wonderful endorsement now aussie soldiers i read a lot of military history and our aussie soldiers in world wars one and two were very much lauded for their bravery and courage mm -hmm. and you know as we read about very instrumental then in freeing Bathsheba and turning the uh the war there, there's so much history that either we don't know or we have forgotten 
And yeah, you absolutely. know what they say about those who are those who what is it? Those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it or those who forget history. Um, so it's sad. And we're going to talk next time with you, Dean, uh, about what's going on in Israel and the Middle East today mm. and maybe get caught up a little bit on, on that. We'll talk about your articles as well. But um, I just want to mention uh, your website again for the church. If anybody's listening over there watching in Australia, it's Iser Street Baptist church.com e-i-s-e-r-s-t that's iser street baptist church.com and you can get dean's info at harbingers daily um dean as we close this out there's a lot happening in the world there's a lot of potentially uh, for for believers even uh, discouraging mm -hmm. or overwhelming um events world events god's not surprised he's still on his throne we still have a the gospel of hope to share mm -hmm. with people. So just your encouragement to our viewers before we wrap it up with you. Yeah, absolutely. Adrian Rogers, who you remember, Adrian was a great American preacher, one of my absolutely. favorites. Yes. He used to say that we ought to be living as if Christ died yesterday, rose this morning, and is coming again this afternoon. And mm -hmm. so I think if every believer lived with that in view, we would have a much greater impact throughout the world. But I just want to encourage people and say we've always got to be looking up because I think as Tom Hughes recently said, if we have a vertical up look, then that takes away the horizontal panic. If we look around, then we are going to get discouraged. And this is what Satan does. He wants to bring division. He wants to bring discouragement. He wants to bring destruction. So it makes us think that God doesn't have everything under control. Hmm. But God does have everything under control. He's sovereign. We can rest in him. We can have faith in him. He's going to sort all of this out, and it's going to be a wonderful time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to rule and reign in the millennial kingdom. Oh, praise God. I'm encouraged. Man, if we have a vertical uplook, we won't have the horizontal panic about what's going on. Yeah. I love that. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm so looking forward to talking with you again next week. Uh, Dean, I really appreciate your time. It's great to connect. What a, what a great connection from here to Australia. So God bless you, brother. We'll talk soon. Amen. Thank you, David. All right. Well, guys, tomorrow we've got Pastor and Dr. Andy Woods on the show, and we're going to be talking about the Islamic invasion, the land over there in the Middle East, the lies about Israel, and the Middle East meltdown with Andy Woods. Thanks for watching, for sharing. We appreciate your donations. Of course, we are thankful for your prayers. God bless you, and as always, keep speaking the truth about things that matter.